right, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time, and we do have a bunch of classes joining us for the first time today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world with over 50 live, free, monthly interactive broadcasts. And in October, it is Space Month, which means we have brought on engineers, roboticists, astronauts, so many amazing people from across the globe. So thank you for joining us in celebrating such amazing people and places. Now, I am a huge space nerd. I love books, DVDs, movies, all sorts of things, everything space that you can throw at me. I absolutely love it. But my favorite series slash book is A Man on the Moon as a book and From the Earth to the Moon as a series. And my favorite episode or part of those tales was the idea that after we landed on the moon originally, we got to the moon, Neil Armstrong walked out, okay, we'd done it, Whew, we'd all survived, it was great. The mission became an effort to make sure that we had the most science done possible on the moon. We wanted to make sure that the astronauts that went up were trained as much as humanly possible in as many disciplines as possible so that they could collect all the data we need to understand our neighbor in the cosmos. And so they got the services of a geologist. Lee Silver joined with the only geologist astronaut, Jack Schmidt, in making sure that the other astronauts were all trained up in geology so that when they went to the moon, they could be best able to find the coolest rocks, the most unique things to bring back to Earth to understand the moon. Now, I absolutely love that story. It's my favorite part of that entire series. And today I'm thrilled to bring on a modern day example of just that. We are joined live by Dr. Cass Marion at Ingenium Canada, the Aviation Space Museum Science Advisor, who is a planetary ge uh, scientist and field geologist who got the chance to go to Labrador with some astronauts, including Joshua Kutrick of the Canadian Space Agency to teach him all about uh, the neat tricks that she's picked up over a uh, career in the scientific world. So I'm gonna just bring up quickly both Dr. Marion and uh, Josh Kutrick. Uh, welcome in guys, so nice to have you here. Dr. Marion, I know you're diving in with the presentation to begin, but thank you both so much for joining us today and I'm so excited to get started. So thank you guys so, so much. <laughs> Awesome, you're good to go, take us away. All right, uh, so it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Jesse, and of course to Josh for being here as well. So hello from Ottawa, like Jesse said, I'm the science advisor at the Canada Aviation and Space Museum here in Ottawa, and I'm a geologist. And in September uh, of this year, just last month, I had the privilege to participate in a geology expedition to Northern Labrador, led by Western University to help train two astronauts, including Canadian astronaut Joshua Kutrick, and a NASA astronaut, Matthew Dominic, uh, in field geology to prepare them for future missions to the moon. Uh, I had a few roles on the expedition, so it was part of the training team, which was led by Dr. Azinski. And since this was my sixth time uh, going to this site in Labrador, I, I took a bit of the tone of field guide slash camp manager, and I also got to document the expedition. So our destination was a meteorite impact crater called Mistaston Lake. It's in northern Labrador. So if you look at this little red box here, um, this would be Newfoundland down here, Goose Bay where we flew in, and then all the way up there to Mistaston Lake. And our camp uh, was on the west side of the lake. So what is this lake? What is a meteorite impact crater? So 36 million years ago, an asteroid collided with the Earth in a really energetic catastrophic event and it broke rocks up, it melted them, it vaporized them and it excavated, it really dug out a hole and ejected some of that material out of the crater and some of it was redeposited in the crater. And now we have this 28 kilometer diameter uh, crater or structure now because it's been quite eroded by, by millions of years of glaciation. But it basically was a hole in the ground formed by the impact of an asteroid. And now it's partly filled with water. But if you look back at this map, the actual craters is somewhere out here. And just the inner part is filled with water. So very importantly, the rocks that were there before the impact, which were hit, these are called anorthosites, which are the same type of rock that make up the lunar highlands, which is the bright white parts of the moon. So if you look at the moon, you can see it's made up of dark spots, and light spots. The dark stuff, these are ancient lava flows, and the white stuff is those northosites that I was talking about. And so same type of rocks were impacted. And this region closer to the South Pole, that's a region where the Artemis missions that are gonna bring humans back to the moon <laughs> are planning on landing. And look at, this, is, this whole region is full of the white stuff. And so you'll also notice the moon is covered in these uh, meteorite impact craters. 
And if I take this one here, this is called Tycho. This is a crater that's very similar to Mistassen, has very similar features. It's got this uplifted section in the center. It's got a, a, a smooth crater floor. So in the case of Mistassen, this is, would be where the lake would lie. And so walking on the, the edge of the lake, you'd be walking on these sediment, these um, deposits here in the inner rim. And so that's the sort of area that we explored uh, when we're at Mistassen. So all this to say that Mistassen, because it has the same rock types as, as a, a good portion of the moon and where we want to go on the moon, and because it's an impact crater, it's the perfect place to bring astronauts to train for the moon. Now, astronauts often have very different expertise. Some are engineers, some are pilots, some are biologists. And so what we want to do is give them the right skill set and the tools to explore the moon and collect and document the best samples so they can bring them back to Earth. So which brings us back to the expedition. So this is our core geology astronaut team. There's five geologists and two astronauts, myself here, and here's Josh here. And this is our um, the lead, uh, Oz, Dr. Arzinski, and, and Matt Dominic there. So to give you an idea of what that training and expedition looked like, I'm gonna just jump through a couple of shots. So mostly what we did was we explored the rock exposures at Mistassen. These are along creek beds or on cliff sides. And if you look at this image here, you can see that there's uh, this giant white cliff, a big rock exposure in the background. This is Oz and Matt and Josh here. And those rock cliffs, they look a lot like moon rocks because they're composed mainly of the same rocks. So it's the best place to go. So we've got a big Breccia Hill, all this broken up uh, rocks to explore. Another place that we went um, were outcrops where there was um, rocks that were melted as from the heat and the pressure of the impact. Uh, there were rocks that were melted in the center and they eventually flowed out from the center of the outcrop, uh, um, center of the crater, sorry. And you can see this section here, all of this, this was basically like molten. It was like a lava flowing out. And then once it cooled, it formed these new rocks. And then there's some broken up rocks underneath. And this is Josh here checking them out. All right. And we also explored some pretty difficult places to get to. Some of those cliff sides uh, were, were an interesting hike to get to. And we also did some very long hikes. One day we did a, about a 20 kilometer hike uh, to get up there. These are also rocks that, that were at, at one point molten um, from the impact of the crater. So how did we get to this crater in remote Labrador? Well, it took me three normal commercial flights. So I flew from Ottawa to Toronto, Toronto to St. John's, Newfoundland, St. John's to Goose Bay. Then I had a day there doing some logistics, buying some food and things. And then on the third day, um, we flew in. And so it took three days to get there. Similar, similarly, to the, it takes three, three days to get to the moon. And then we had to take uh, what's called a twin otter, which is a type of large bush plane. And this is Josh here watching it land. This is the landing strip right next to our camp. It's a, an amazing machine. I have to tell you, it lands in a very sh short uh, strip and it can land on really interesting terrain like shrubs and gravel with no problems because it has these special tundra tires. It's too cool. <laughs> Oh, next. Uh, this is what our camp looked like. So we've got two large tents. One was our kitchen tent where we cooked and the other one was our gathering tent and our equipment tent. And then on the other side of the camp, we had our personal tent. So we each had sort of, that's like our bedroom in camp. And so we made it, you know, our own little community uh, far from home and really close to the lake. So you can see this is the Lumisastin Lake here and this is that central island uh, in the distance. So Miss Dastin is really a, a gorgeous place. It's a very beautiful place, um, but it's also an environment that presents us with a lot of challenges to overcome. And so that was, you know, the added benefit of, of taking the astronauts there as well. And so now uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand the floor over to my uh, expedition teammate, astronaut Joshua Kutrick. Thanks, Cass, and uh, hello, everyone. Good, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. From from Houston is where I'm calling in from, and it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Uh, it's always fun for me to talk about uh, stuff like this because it's, it's very important to me. It's been that way my whole life. So, space science, exploring, 
Uh, we'll talk a little bit about flying and a little bit about rockets at the end. Uh, just absolutely wonderful to spend that time with you. And I look forward to your, your questions later on today. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about our trip and a little bit about myself. Here you can see um, a few of us. You see me, NASA astronaut Matt Dominic Cassandra, of course, who's just speaking with us. And then our, our group leader, uh, Oz from Western University over on the right. Beautiful and pristine and very isolated country out there and just an absolute privilege and treat. I feel so lucky uh, to have been able to spend this kind of time in that kind of a place. Let's go to the next slide. Thanks. So, you know, uh, Cass touched on this. I think that for us as astronauts, there's really, it comes down to two main reasons why, why we do stuff like this, why we do a geology expedition um, with Geolo geological experts. Um, and I think the first reason is a scientific one. You know, uh, the saying goes that I think old, old dogs uh, don't learn new tricks. Well, they can learn new tricks. It just takes a bunch of time. And in that metaphor, uh, Matt and I, the two astronauts on this trip, we're the old dogs and we're trying to learn new tricks. So we're both test pilots. Um, but in our new role, we're both relatively new astronauts. Um, we're trying to get ready to do science on missions that are being planned for the future. And as Cass told you, a lot of that science is going to be geology. We know that. Um, and so the people who could end up on those missions have to learn geology if they don't have a background in it. Um, and that, that's really the kind of the, the simplest way of looking at um, reason number one, why we're out there. Uh, I think reason number two is that um, an expedition like this, where we go into a, a super isolated place, where we're dependent on each other, where there's risk and there's there's consequence, where you can't really make a lot of mistakes. Um, in a lot of ways, that's like what life is like right now for the astronauts on the International Space Station. And so for that reason, we do expeditions like this because it helps us to practice what we call expeditionary skills. Uh, it forces us to live and to do science in an environment that has some similarities with the environment of space and that you're very dependent on each other and that you're have to, having to do science, difficult science in, a, in an austere and a difficult, um, dangerous environment. Next slide. So a little bit on my background. Uh, this is a photograph of the four current Canadian astronauts uh, who work for the Canadian Space Agency. We mostly live and work down here at Johnson Space Center in Houston. And that's where this photograph was taken. Um, I very much consider myself to be a new astronaut. I was selected with Jenny. Uh, you see the two of us in the middle there uh, just a few years ago in 2017. And since then, we have done mostly just training. So when you're first hired, uh, you train, 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 train. It's like going back to university um, for about three years in order to become a certified astronaut and eligible for missions. And after that, you sort of transition into a little less training. You continue to train, um, but you also start to work and to, to do technical jobs that the astronaut office here does um, on the ground before you fly in space. And that's kind of the stage of, of our uh, astronaut career that we're at right now. Next slide. Um, I wasn't always an astronaut. I, I used to be a lot of things. Uh, at one point, I was a farmer. I grew up on a farm in eastern Alberta. Uh, so this is a picture from about 20 years ago. Um, you know, I throw it in there because I wasn't surrounded by a lot of space uh, growing up, but I but I always had it in my head for whatever reason. I remember being uh, very curious around the world about the world around me, uh, very excited about exploration, very passionate about flying, and I didn't. I never knew if it would be possible to become an astronaut, but I knew that it, it was something I wanted to try to do. Um, with my professional life. And I've, I've been very lucky in that sense. Next slide. Uh, I got bit by the flying bug very, very early. I've been flying my, my whole career. Um, and, and that is in, in some ways, I think what sort of helped me to get to where I am right now. Um, I was a commercial pilot a long time ago. Uh, I was ended up being a fighter pilot and then a test pilot for Canada for a, a number of years, mostly on the F-18. And I still fly a lot of airplanes down here, like these ones, which are the NASA T-38s. Uh, next slide. This photograph kind of sums up, I think, what I just said. The, the two favorite things in, in my life, professionally anyway, are in this photograph. So it's exploration and the moon and pushing human boundaries, advancing technology. That's all there on the left with the moon and where we want to go. And then on the right, uh, as I've said, I've, I've spent the majority of my professional career until this job um, in that airplane, which is the F-18 and doing developmental experimental flight tests there. Uh, next slide. 
Yeah, this is just an example of sort of our day-to-day -day work. Yesterday, actually, I was in, uh, I was here. This is the Neutral Buoyancy Lab in Houston. Uh, once you're a certified astronaut before you fly in space, we spend a lot of time in here as an example of the work that we do, um, proving out and helping to test and develop uh, new technologies, new spacewalk procedures before they get launched and, and executed in space. And so we spend a lot of time here, about six or seven hours at a time on any given day underwater, uh, working with, with technical teams to help develop those procedures. And uh, it's hard work, um, but it's a lot of fun, of course. Next slide. Uh, one more example of some of the stuff that we do. We're talking today about a geology expedition. This is another expedition I was on recently, which was a underground caving expedition. Um, but a lot of similarities in terms of what we're trying to do. We're trying to learn new skills. Here we're learning about uh, microbiology and, and chemistry in the, the underworld environment. Um, and at the same time, we're practicing those space skills, expeditionary skills. This is an international team uh, about 200 meters underneath Italy in this photograph. And we were down there for three weeks exploring, uh, surveying a cave system and doing a lot of science on behalf of universities who were up on top on the surface of the earth uh, telling us what to do, basically. Next slide. This is the International Space Station. I think most are pretty familiar with it. Uh, it's big. This is uh, about the size of a football field that you're looking at. And this is where we send Canada and other partners in the, the space program, where we send a lot of people to right now. Um, this station has had humans on board continuously since uh, two, 2000, so over 20 years now, which is pretty hard to think about. Uh, well over, I would guess, the lifespan of many of you who are tuning into this. And so that's kind of kind of something that's neat to think about in terms of the progress that we're making. Um, next slide. There's a picture from inside that space station, and uh, it's a neat picture because although there's always a crew of international astronauts there, um, in this photograph you see David St. Jacques, Canadian astronaut, in the upper right. He looks like he's upside down. Uh, he was on the space station for about seven months. Yeah, right there under the mouse. Next slide. So the space station is kind of what NASA and its partners, the you know Canada Canadian Space Agency, have been working on for the last several decades, and we're going to continue to to do that work going forward. Um, but we're also now working on another parallel project, and that's what this photo is about. So this is the the kind of the future, the next ten years. Um, this rocket is is ginormous. It's called SLS. Um, I've seen it. it. It's done now. It's in Florida, and it's going to fly for the very first time in history here in a couple months, in early 2022. It's going to fly without a crew as a test flight out to the moon, do a whole bunch of, of testing, and then come back to Earth. Um, and that'll be called the Artemis 1, 1 mission. After that, this, this rocket is going to fly with crew back to the moon. It's going to take humans back to the moon for the first time ever since Apollo. Um, it's going to take those four humans farther and faster than any human being has ever gone, ever. Um, and it's going to launch in 2023, late 2023. It's called Artemis II. And the most important thing to remember about this first mission back to the moon, Artemis II, uh, is that we know there's going to be a Canadian. So there's four people on it, and one of them is going to be a Canadian. And uh, I think that that's something that, that I'm pretty proud of myself, uh, being a Canadian, working for the, the Canadian Space Agency. Next slide. And of course, um, this is this is my my last one. This is what it's all about. So if you think about we've been working at the International Space Station in the next six or seven years, we're taking the next step to go back to the moon, but not just to go back to the moon and come back. We want to go to the moon and and stay there and, and work and live and study and do science on the surface of the moon for long periods of time, kind of like we do now in low Earth orbit on the space station. And these missions are all planned to take place here, starting, like I said, in 2022, 23, and then throughout the 2020s. So it's happening actually quite quickly. Um, Canada is a prime partner. We're, we're building the robotic system for the space station that's going to be built around the moon. Um, and this is all stuff that's being built and, and coming together right now, actually in buildings and rooms uh, right around where I'm, I'm speaking to you from today. So uh, awesome stuff. And I think that if you're a, a young Canadian who, like I was, uh, finds yourself interested in science and space and exploring, um, the future is, is very, very bright. Uh, because we really are going here. It's going to happen in the next few years. Um, and what's going to happen after that, the third step is Mars. And I think 
you know, we're going to see that in the 2030s, the first human mission to Mars, which is just awesome. Next slide. I think we'll probably go back to uh, back to you guys and we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. What an awesome talk. And, and again, all space month long, we've been highlighting that this really is the most exciting time to ever be in space. I know the Apollo missions were really exciting in the late 50s, early 60s. So much was going on uh, to really pave the way for what we're leading to now, which is going back uh, to build permanent habitations, to up our, our game in terms of space stations across the you know our, our solar system, and to go to Mars, which is of such interest to so many students in our classes today. Uh, so thank you guys so much for those uh, that, that fantastic story. And I, I do, I want to dive in with questions. We've got our live classes joining us from Ontario and Georgia. We've got another group joining us in Guelph uh, on YouTube. So welcome in. If you're also on YouTube, please do feel free to share questions in the chat bar, and we can dive in. Uh, Dr. Marion, if you want to exit your screen share you can it's entirely up to you uh so they can see us a little better have a bit of a chat uh but let's dive in first with our class in jordan miss bullock's class uh Catala, welcome in and if you have a question to kick us off go for it guys hey everybody jay come here hey. Hey. Come on. yeah go ahead how are you preparing radiation wait what <laughs> <laughs> for the radiation in space how are we preparing for radiation in space, Joshua? <laughs> yeah, I can start. It's a, it's a really good question. Radiation in space is one of the, the biggest challenges uh, that's associated with these future missions. So for all kinds of, of science reasons, um, once we leave low Earth orbit, once we leave where the space station is right now, radiation becomes a big, big risk for humans. And um, there, there's thousands of people right here where I am in Houston who are working on this problem every day. Um, there's a couple of things that we're, we're really interested in. I think that the spaceships, the vehicles in which the astronauts are on these long voyages are going to end up being heavily shielded um, in different ways from the radiation. Uh, and we're, there's also a lot of work being done to develop um, healthcare techniques and, and, and sort of telemedicine that we will actually be taking with us to help deal uh, with with consequences of radiation should we encounter them. Um, it, it's a big, big challenge. It's one of the reasons we haven't done these missions yet. We have to let technology catch up to us um, because as, as you probably know, they're, they're really far, the distances involved are huge, and the time involved is huge. I mean, the moon is, is 250,000 miles away. Um, we can go there and back in, in a couple weeks. Mars uh, we're talking about a couple of years, and these are missions we want to do relatively soon. So you know, we have to give radiation a, a, a big, big thought. I uh, love when you mentioned uh, in the talk earlier the fact that it took as long to get to your site in Labrador as it does to get to the moon. That was fantastic. And I, I like that we highlighted the difference between the moon and Mars in this case. You know, it's something that we get a lot from kids or, oh, what about Neptune? What about Jupiter? I mean, these are really, really far away, and it's stuff that we're still developing in terms of technology to be able to you know, get people there safely and, and, and alive, uh, so to speak. So great job on the questions. Now, if YouTube is any indication, this always happens, and, and I apologize, Dr. Marion, uh, when there's an astronaut involved, the questions tend to go to you. So I want to lead off with a question for you, Cass, uh, which is why choose the site that you did? So, I mean, as a planetary scientist, as a field geologist, why Labrador? Why that specific area? Is there Are there other places around the world that are similar that people have done training like this in the past? Um. There are similar places. I mean, and Josh can tell you that he's he's trained in a variety of places. One of them is another impact crater, meteor crater in Arizona. But the reason we chose Labrador, and I touched on this in, in my talk, is in our talk, is that those anorthosites that I was talking about, Mistaston is the only crater, well, it's one of two craters on the whole planet, like on all of Earth, that has impacted those same type of rocks. And it's the one where they're most present. So there's another crater, which actually is also in Canada, in Quebec, called the Manicouagan uh, impact structure. And it has those anorthosites, but there's not as much there and it's not as well preserved. So Mistaston uh, is really the best place that has the, the same rock types and is an impact crater. Because on the moon, those anorthosites, they're a really common rock type. They actually make up of most of the crust of the moon, but on the earth, they're quite rare. Very cool. And then Joshua, for you, going to a place like this, what was that actually like? I mean, uh, Kaz has been lucky to visit places like this throughout her career, amazing places all over the globe. Um, what's it like, I don't know, learning about it for the first time, so to speak? 
Well, it, it's awesome uh, to have the opportunity to go to a place like that. I've been through to much, probably the majority of Canada, I suppose. But until this trip, I had never had the opportunity to to be off the beaten path uh, like that in northern Labrador. And if if you if you're like I was, and you you've gone your whole life without ever being in a place like that, it, it's really awe inspiring, actually, and it makes you feel happy and lucky and proud to be Canadian because all over the world um, there's neat topography, but I don't think you I've ever seen topography quite like that. And if I just think about the the Twin Otter flight in as we're flying over the, these hundreds and hundreds of miles of, of just absolute pristine wilderness, mountains, lakes, craters, uh, so, some of the most beautiful scenery that you will ever see on this planet. And uh, I just feel very lucky to, to have been able to partake because of it. I love that as a travel plug. We had an American scientist who now lives in Canada and was talking about how fantastic Canada is. So this is the theme of the day. I know we've got a bit of an American audience today, but I must say we're pretty proud to be Canadian up here. And uh, thank you for highlighting all that too. It's a really special country to fly over and to explore if you get the chance uh, for our students across the country. Let's head to Etobicoke where I grew up as a boy. I'm Ms. Varden's class. If you guys want to come in, grade four. You had your mic on earlier. If it's not working, I know you did type in the question, but you should be good to go. Nope, maybe it's not working now. Sorry if the mic's not working. You did share the question in the chat, so I will take it from there, but uh, welcome in Ms. Varden. So their first question was, do, 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 how long do astronauts stay at the International Space Station? So Joshua, I'm sure you can build this one. Yeah, it depends. Um, right now, the, the typical mission to the International Space Station is really long. I would say seven months to a year. Um, and the reason we're doing that is because we're using those long duration missions to learn about the human body, to study and develop uh, the technologies that we need to take that seven month or year long space mission and make it even longer so that we can be talking about a year and then eventually two years of, of humans in outer space, which is what we're going to have to do when it comes to Mars. So uh, right now down here, it's all about long duration space flight. And uh, your, your typical average every, every day, if you can call it that mission to the International Space Station is uh, at least six or seven months. Outstanding. I think that's been our most popular question throughout the entire week. And I, I really encourage you, I don't have it up as a banner right now, spotthestation.nasa.gov. You can find out anywhere you are on this planet where you can look at night to see the International Space Station crossover. And I mean, many of us might have seen satellites if you're in an area without too, too much light pollution, you will have seen them uh, if you just take a peek up at the sky. But the International Space Station is something special, even from the ground. It is so, so bright, so amazing, and incredible to think that people are living and working on something that we can watch uh, orbit the Earth every 90 minutes. Am I correct with that figure? Yeah. 90 minutes, yeah, it, it, it's it's the fastest thing in the sky. It's going about 27 and a half thousand kilometers an hour. It, it's oh, very cool, I, I mean, I, I think all of us want to drop everything to be an astronaut, but it's things like that that really drive the point home. Uh, let's head to Mr. Atkinson's class. I know you guys came in a, a couple minutes in, so hopefully all the tech's working and you're good yeah, to go. Yeah, hopefully, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, you're perfect. All right, perfect. great, I got my uh, student here, Dominic. Hello. Uh, besides the crater itself, is there any evidence to suggest that the meteor that hit uh, affected the environment around around it? Cool question, guys. All right, guys. Wow. I love that question. Um, so when the meteor hit, I'm sure that there was some major environmental effects. Um, it was quite a large impact, but we can't actually see, aside from the rocks, there's not a whole lot that's been preserved. Uh, today because it was millions of years ago and there's been many glaciations that have sort of mowed over that region. But when the impact occurred, there would have been, you know, soot and dust and material launched up into the air. The atmosphere would have been, uh, you know, you would choke on the air there. There would have been a lot of heat. There probably would have been uh, forest fires in the surrounding area. It could have uh, caused some earthquakes. There's lots of different environmental effects, negative effects, uh, definitely if you lived close by um, at, at the time. But now uh, there's not a whole lot of evidence aside from the actual hole in the ground and the rocks that are left behind. Awesome question, guys. All right, uh, we are getting more questions from Miss Nagel that we could take in 100 broadcasts. So way to go in Guelph 7 eight. You guys are awesome. Uh, so many questions, which to choose, which to choose. Do, 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 do. Uh, wow, so many. Oh, do you know when your next miss mission is? So Joshua, if you could explain a little bit about how missions are allocated and maybe when you might have the opportunity to go to space, that would be fantastic. 
Yeah, so for Canada, uh, we, we don't know who yet. We know what the next missions are. Um, Canada right now is getting ready to send a, an astronaut on a moon mission, Artemis II, in 2023, which is coming up pretty quick in a couple years. Uh, and then we're going to send another astronaut to the International Space Station for a long duration mission of about seven or eight months again, and that will be in 2024, 2025. Um, so those are the two missions on Canada's near term horizon. Um, after those two are flown, there'll be there'll be two more that are like that. So we know that in the later part of this decade, there'll be another uh, moon mission for Canada, uh, a longer a longer mission this time to the moon, uh, as well as another long duration uh, science mission on the International Space Station. So um, we actually have for for this country, what I would say is is quite a number uh, coming up. Um, but you know, space is a bit of a weird thing because of the technology development involved, because of the money involved, because of the international partnerships involved, it can be a hard thing to, to forecast. Um, and it can also be be a long road. So if you're an astronaut like me, or, or any of the four of us, really, uh, we don't expect to fly in space regularly. That's not the, the day to day life of, a, of an astronaut. Uh, most astronauts will train for probably seven or eight years prior to their first mission. And then they might fly a mission or two um, over kind of a 20 year time period. So just to give you a, a little bit of insight into to what my my world looks like right now. Yeah, thank you so, so much for that. And I, again, this is only a, a 45 minute presentation highlighting this, but if you read books by Chris Hatfield, Mike Massimino, David Williams, I mean, astronauts are, are really fantastic authors in many cases as well. And they talk about the importance of being vested in all these other aspects of your career. I know it's really sexy and romantic to think of going to space, but it's a really fulfilling, fantastic program where you get to draw upon all this training that you've had the opportunity to do both in the astronaut program and over you know decades of experience as a pilot and more uh, to really do some really impactful, meaningful things in terms of science and exploration of the cosmos. So uh, great, great question, guys. Um, all right, Miss Bullock's class, we're going back to Georgia. Actually, before we go back to Georgia, I want to highlight, I already talked about everyone should go and spot the station tonight when you can literally tonight, go do it. Um, for the folks in Georgia, if you go one state south, uh, we talked about the Space Launch System, this incredible rocket that's gonna be taking us further than we've ever gone before. At uh, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, near Cocoa Beach, if you ever get the opportunity, go and see the Saturn V rocket. They've got it tilted on its side. It was the rocket that took us to the moon. It is mind blowing to see that thing in person. It's just awe inspiring, no matter how many pictures you see, see all the video you want, it's quite a different experience to stand beside it. So I hope you guys get that chance. Miss Bullock's class, I know you're typing questions in the chat, but more fun live. Come on back in. Hey, guys. How do you know the age of the craters? Yes. All right, Kaz, I think that's good for you. <laughs> sure. That's a great question and a really important one. Uh, so the, the age of the craters on Earth, it depends... So we, we have a couple of different techniques we can use, but the, the main one is radiometric age dating. That's a big word, but basically um, material, some, some materials and some elements on the periodic table, they actually go on, um, they're subjected to radioactive decay. And if we use a little bit of math, we can actually take out some of the, these elements out of particular minerals. In the case of mistastin, we used argon out of a mineral called um, feldspar, and we calculated how much decay had happened, and that's how we got the 36 million years. But depending on what uh, rocks and minerals are present, we might use different types of radioactive uh, decay. And then another way, so for on the moon, for example, we can actually we have do we do have rocks from the moon from the from the Apollo missions and some meteorites. We, we use a relative way of dating the rocks. And that is, if there's a region that has far more impact craters, it's probably older than a region that has fewer impact craters. I love every time we get the chance to talk about radioactive decay. It's the coolest science. It shows up in so many different disciplines in the field. Half the books on my shelf have radioactive decay of some form or other <laughs> in terms of understanding the, the world around us. It's amazing. Honestly, I know some of our students are a little young to be diving into the science of this just yet, but when you guys get older, it is the coolest thing. Uh, revel in it at every chance you get. Awesome, guys. All right. Ms. Varden's class, I'm going to say hi to you. Hello, Ms. Varden. I know your mic isn't working. You have so many great questions. Okay. Um, I like this, Joshua. This is for you. Do you have parachutes to help you if there's a problem during the fight? You're, you're going towards the moon and the rockets fail. Is there a big parachute to save you? What's going on? 
Uh, yeah, that, that's a, an awesome question. There's not parachutes to save us in space uh, because in space it, it's a vacuum, which is to say that there's no air. If you put the parachutes out, um, it, it would just it would just fuzzle along like a, a piece of loose string and it wouldn't work at all. So we don't use parachutes in space. We have other uh, rescue systems and backup engines that we would hope to depend on. We do use parachutes in a lot of other applications. We use parachutes, of course, on the way back to Earth. So after uh, we've slowed down from, from these crazy speeds of 30,000 plus kilometers an hour, and we're only going you know, several thousand kilometers an hour, in Earth's atmosphere, we'll use parachutes to help the spacecraft slow down even more. And then we'll use more parachutes to help sort of cushion the landing as the spacecraft impacts the land or the water with astronauts on board. So parachutes get used a lot, um, but only in kind of the, the final, final stage of a, a space mission, which is inside the Earth's atmosphere. If you guys want to see parachutes used in space in the coolest way possible, we had a bunch of NASA engineers talk about their sky crane system to get the Curiosity rover on the surface of Mars. That is some amazing stuff. And then the film that they have uh, from that mission is just wild. Joshua, I'm going to keep you on camera because we have a simple question, but also profound from Trent uh, in Ms. Nagel's class. Why do astronauts go to the moon? Why are we heading back? Yeah, wow. That That's a... That question has a long answer to it. I, I'll try to give you the shortest answer I can give. And maybe there's, uh, there's two things I want you to think about. The first is that we have to keep exploring. So sort of the, the idea that this is what makes us humans. This is why we have everything that we have today. This is why we have technology. It's because humans never stopped looking, never stopped trying to cross that next hill, go past the horizon, cross the next ocean. Uh, we've never stopped exploring. And I think we owe everything that we have in our evolution to the fact that that we've always done that. Uh, and space is just just the next step. It's the next frontier, as they say. It's the next step in that that big journey of exploration. And we have to do it because we have to keep progressing. Um, I, I don't think you know human beings can stop with that. But then the the sort of the second reason are all the practical reasons of why we go to space. Space costs a lot of money. Um, but we spend that money because we get that money back. So the science and the discoveries that we, we make through space, what we've learned from building the space station, um, there, there's a host of technologies, thousands of examples of things that are in your everyday life from, from cell phones and, and the internet, uh, things that you have that we have here on earth that make life better for us on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, but they were invented be or discovered uh, because we went to space. And, and so on a practical sort of level, that's why we really do it. We're, we go there to learn things and to develop new technologies. That was a beautiful and nuanced answer for a couple minutes. So thank you for that very, very much. And thanks to Trent for the question. Yeah. We have questions to go through like 20 broadcasts of this, which is great. I love all your enthusiasm. I'm going to head to Mr. Atkinson's class for one final one live on camera because time flies when you're having fun. And then what I'll do is provide resources where you guys can keep the learning going after you're done this session. So Mr. Atkinson's class, come on back up, unmute your mic, and you are good to go. But unmute first. Come closer to the computer. I can't hear you yet. As much as I want to hear you. If you yell, I am in St. Catharines. It might work. There we go. Here we are. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, how do you know the rocks around the crater in Newfoundland are the same as those on the moon? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so we know a lot about rocks on, on Earth, and we also have rock samples that the Apollo astronauts brought back. Um, from those Apollo missions. And so we've compared those samples to the ones that we have on Earth. And that's how we know we're the same because we have rocks back from the moon. So we've confirmed it in person. We've looked at them under the microscope. We've analyzed them with heavy machinery. Um, they are confirmed. Yeah, very, very cool. Actually, I, sorry, I want to do a brief segue just because it's one of my very favorite things in all of science. And we do have an extra minute before we dive in with those resources. One of the coolest types of scientific missions on this planet. I don't know if you've ever had the chance to be involved in one of these or no colleagues who might. Antarctic expeditions looking for meteorites. Have you ever been a part of one of these? Really? I I have not, but okay. Oz, Oz, the lead on our mission, has been twice on the wow. ANSMIT missions looking for meteorites. They basically drive snowmobiles across the ice and look for black rocks in a sea of white. 
Because if you're walking around in Labrador and you find a rock, the chances are that that rock comes from Earth. But if you're walking on an ice sheet, there's no way for the rock to get there other than for it to come from space. And so scientists go down every single year to go look for amazing meteorites because you have this white expanse and you can easily point out and find the black rocks. So Dr. Oz has been on our broadcast before, an amazing speaker, an amazing scientist. And I, I really hope you get that chance one day because it is such a special <laughs> opportunity in place. Uh, guys, this has been so, so much fun. Thank you so much to all our classes for joining in your enthusiasm and your, your ceaseless questions. This has been great. Uh, if you guys do want to learn more, Dr. Marion is joining from Ingenium, so Canada's main three amazing museums in Ottawa and the capital area. The Aviation and Space Museum is, is top notch. Uh, for our American friends, the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum is also truly an incredible place. I really encourage you guys to visit those places in person if you get the chance. And of course, if you want to learn more about space and the missions that are coming, Canadian Space Agency has a beautiful website. So does NASA for our American friends in the States. And of course, any space agency from around the world, it is the coolest time to ever be interested in space. If you want to check out any of our past broadcasts all month long, they are on our YouTube channel for you guys to peruse at whim. And of course, you can watch this one after the fact as well to hear these stories from Joshua and Cass who have joined us so uh, graciously today. So, uh, Cass and Josh, I'm going to bring you guys back on. And what we do to end every broadcast, I'll, I'll give you the, the fun exploring by the Seat Your Pants send off. We bring in all our classes to say, join me in saying a big thank you and farewell. So, Ms. Bullock's class in Georgia, Ms. Varden, Mr. Atkinson's class. If you guys could join me in saying thank you and farewell. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye for now, guys. Bye, guys.